What's up, man? Woo <laughs> Willis, bro, in the house. What's How you up, doing, man? man? Good. First of all, thank you for bringing the whiskey. Of course. Wood for Reserve. You know what? Uh, when, when you said that you're launching this new podcast, I figured I had to, uh, you know, commemorate it with a bottle of whiskey. I, mean, I appreciate Whiskey that. from Whiskey Whiskey, why not? Hell yeah. <laughs> and he brings some good stuff, too. So yeah. right now on the tables, we have a bottle of Woodford on his side, and we got Buff Trace on, on my side. In my opinion, some of the best whiskey out there. Yeah. yeah. Like, people could be snobby and jack up the price colonel taylor and all this stuff but it's like at the end of the day what do you enjoy drinking mm -hmm. and for me wood for reserve and buff trace are at the top of the list i say eagle rare wood for reserve buff trace all bargain mm -hmm. really good tasting whiskeys yeah i mean it's reasonably priced mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's it's you know it's a hell of a lot better than jameson and and like look i'm a fan of jameson but uh you know, as you get older, I think your tastes get more refined, and, yeah. and and you want something that you can drink neat or with right. just a couple cubes of ice, and and uh, and not uh, feel that regurge. Yeah, <laughs> that acid just reflux. Just get it down. Yeah, yeah. I did take a little bit of a dive, uh, me and Kurt and I, into tequila, mm -hmm. and like I was like, oh man, because I used to think because you, you you drink when you're younger to get drunk, mm -hmm. so you're just shooting this like toxic fuel down and you're yeah. like oh i hate tequila it's like no you just haven't tried the good stuff when i was when i was young and in the ranger battalion i thought it was cool to have like a, a bottle of um jose cuervo in my back pocket you know what oh, i mean in and the just, pocket yeah nice, and just like dude. you know like a little fifth back there a little whatever those little, little I, flask like, yeah a little flask yeah. and like and just sip jose cuervo <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> terrible <laughs> terrible <man. laughs> but so, like i was trying to be a tough guy yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. And always have some freaking booze on me, i love so, it yeah. i love it so one thing that like and i know i got wrong when uh we first started talking it's been a while now mm -hmm. and i was like oh your ranger deal is so cool and you're like bro why does everyone forget yeah that was a pj yeah, yeah. And so tell us about that. Like, you're, you're, let's go through your military a little mm -hmm. bit because, and I want to say that I'm, I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. I loved what you did in Forge and Fire. You've been hosting shows for a long time. Yeah. And few. you've done some great work on the show side. And to be honest, you've done so much great work on the show side that it tends to get lost just how much work you did on the military side. Right. So let's jump into that before we get into the colorful career that you've had post military. Because right. not only Ranger, but PJ, I mean, yeah. that's two of the hardest selection processes in the military. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, so when I initially wanted to go into the military, I was looking at the Air Force. I took my ASVABs for the Air Force. And, uh, you know, the idea of being a PJ was very appealing to me. It was special operations, but it was Air Force. My dad was Air Force, and I was encouraged to go the Air Force route. And the medical aspect also appealed to me. I don't know why. I'm a trauma super freak. I love it. Mm. But um, but then my recruiter like rotated out, and another guy rotated in. You know, and that's just you know natural. You know, reassigned whatever. And then the new recruiter basically. I mean, I remember it word for word. He was like, "You going to the Air Force? You can't just be a PJ. If the Air Force needs cooks, you're going to be a cook." And I didn't like that. And so, you know, my senior year of high school, I was like, I'm not going into the military. And then and then I decided after, you know, working a civilian job, construction, to, you know, landscaping supply kind of business, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this military thing. I got to get out of my town. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have a, a life less ordinary. I wanted to have a, an adventure. You know, I was an avid reader. I liked the idea of, like, I, I read a lot of Dungeons & Dragons, right? So I like the idea of like serving in a brotherhood, you know. So when I went to the army recruiter and I told him I wanted to blow shit up, shoot people in the face, he's like, "Well, are you afraid of heights? I can, have I got the job for you? Show me the Ranger video." And I said, "Yeah, that's it. But like, get me out of here now." So um, went into the army. You know, it was one station unit training at, at Fort Benning. You know, did airborne school, did RIP. And the more that I kind of engaged in it and that negative reinforcement atmosphere, the more I loved it. You know what I mean? Like, you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to show you that I can, right? And that's one of the things in the military that people don't really understand is, like, the more you tell somebody that they can't do something, they can't overcome odds, the more you kind of rise to the occasion and every time you rise to the occasion you push yourself more and more and more and you're like i'm so much i'm capable of anything right and then um 
so I was a ranger in the 90s, like 94 to 98. You know, I went in it like 17 days after Mogadishu, I entered service. And then I end up at 3rd Ranger Battalion where, you know, all the rangers from Mogadishu were. I go to Alphatraz, which is Alpha Company back then. I called it Alphatraz. I remember sitting in the PAC office. They were like, who wants to go to Alphatraz? I was the only dude that raised my hand, right? But 13 of us went there. And by the next, by the next day, I think there were five of us left, you know, because dudes that had already passed rip in that one night of introduction to, like, your platoons and your company, you know, like a bunch of guys quit. They were like, really? I'm not, oh, yeah, dude. Like, it didn't stop at rip. They got their tan berets and quit, right? Well, it wasn't tan back then. We had the black berets. Oh, That's okay, like back okay. when the black was the standard, and then and then that Shazinski guy fucked it all up for everybody. <laughs> 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 like everybody's special. No, they're not. You yeah. know what I mean? But um, but uh, yeah. So like that first night was pretty. It was like an intro to like there was a lot of hazing back then. You know, you're up all night, you know, doing whatever, but uh, there were only five guys left. And then I did my four years there, and I was, like, hard charging. I thought it was going to be a lifer, you know. But I, I'm also one of those guys that asks a lot of questions. And in the Ranger Battalion back then, it wasn't okay to be the guy that's always questioning authority, always questioning you know things and and um and we worked with pjs and you know we were always spinning up for a mission like the haiti thing or getting recalled for something and 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 you're like okay we're gonna launch we're gonna go do combat we're gonna go you know get into the mix which is what i wanted and um and it always spun back down and then working with the pjs and again i knew a little bit about it from like my prior to going into the army you know, I was like, these guys smell like soap. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not sleeping in the dirt for absolutely no reason. Not to say it was no reason, but back then, like, I mean, come on, you're marching from range to range to range. You can see the barracks, but you're freaking, like, sleeping in the dirt. There was a lot of stuff that, like, I was like, this is not good for, you know, overall training objectives. You know what I mean? And in my opinion, again, but... um so I was looking at the PJs. I didn't really know anything about the NDOC or the selection process or anything like that. I was like, hotel rooms, rental cars, Air Force bases, <laughs> you know, Air Force chow. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, and they also were getting hazardous duty allowance pay. They were getting free fall qualified. They were scuba qualified. You know, they had the, these advanced quals. And I was like, okay, these guys are stepping right into a pipeline where they get all these schools and they come out as fully capable operators. You know, I thought that, you know, cause you were always jockeying with like another ranger for like, you know, a slot to go to ranger school or to go to seer school or something like that. And it, it was merit based, which is great. But at the same time, if, if you weren't there for 13 years, you never could have got all the quals that I got coming out of the pipeline. So I left the military in 98, I did three months of like civilian knock around, getting laid off of jobs, construction, driving dump trucks, and and then uh, I, I decided to go back into the Air Force. I'm like, I'm going to do the Air Force thing, and I went and saw the recruiter. I lost a pay grade coming across, which sucked, but I think it was worth it in the long run. What were you at coming out? It was an E5 coming out okay. after four years in the Army, E5 coming out, and then they knocked me back to E4 and, you know, whatever, and then I went to you know the air force recruiter and and i was a two pack a day cigarette smoker you know i, I still smoke cigarettes every now and again but yeah. uh probably the only pj that ever smoked cigarettes consistent consistently like through my entire career because they're runners right i mean PJs. yeah yeah well i mean it, it supposedly you know what i mean that's but, the, uh, the aura about it almost like a sf dive team yeah our guys are those guys are like the super fit guys. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to go to the dive team and you're going to be underwater, you're going to be the super fit guy. Your yeah. team's going to be running. You're not going to be the the biggest team in the company. You're going to yeah. be the runner, super fit because oxygen usage and all that. Right, right. And uh, I mean, I don't know how I did it. I know that when I showed up at the end dock, I was like smoking a cigarette. I'm like, I guess I got to go do some water shit now. <laughs> but like through the end dock, I actually quit smoking, no dip, you know, stuff like that. And, and I think physically the Air Force indoctrination, the physical standard that you had to achieve every day was above and beyond what I was expecting. Like, we started with probably 120 guys, graduated 18. Ooh, really? And then of those 18, we even lost some throughout the pipeline. Like, of those 18, maybe 
you know, maybe 14 of them actually became PJs. So how's that? You have the, the in-doc is your selection process? Yeah, that that's the initial. I mean, the entire pipeline is selection. So if you think about when you go to your 10-week indoctrination course, only about eight weeks of it is actually selection because the last two weeks is all admin, getting mm. you in your pipeline, physical, stuff like that. Um, that's the, the biggest attrition portion of the course. But then you go to, you know, scuba school. Well, that's another selection. You Damn know, right. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's another selection. Like how many guys at scuba school get washed out? Like I can tell you right now, we lost one of our PJ guys that graduated the induct at scuba school, just washed out. And okay, so we'll, we're a man down there. Now we're going to go to um, airborne school. Nobody washes out of airborne school, like, but people like nobody who's gone through the indoc washes out right. of airborne school but like people do wash out of airborne school there is a little bit of attrition there mm -hmm. now you go to seer school nobody really washes out of that um you got your dunker training again it's like a big joke what's yeah. dunker training dunker training is like aircraft um egress training and okay. we would do it in jacksonville florida where they take it's like two days long they take you in a, in a mock-up aircraft they they turn it over upside down and then you have to egress the aircraft okay you know so but that was a joke because it was like you know you're upside down in this aircraft staring at one another like who's going to stay in the longest <laughs> you know what i mean and then you got you got like the navy divers that are like oh my god it's these guys again <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know not a, not really a big deal and of course nobody washes out of that but then you get into like your paramedic program okay and if you are hard but not smart you're not gonna make it and you have guys wash out of paramedic or wash out of the medical training. I went to SOMSI and we lost guys oh, at SOMSI. SF lo loses yeah. so many to SOMSI. And again, it's, it's, it's an attrition course. Mm -hmm. There is an expected attrition and I think we probably lost half throughout the entire course of SOMSI. And then, you know, after and SOMSI. SOMSI stands for Special, Special Operations. Special Operations Combat Medic Course. Combat yeah. Medic Course. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So. Because in SF, they'll do, the Deltas will get selected. And then before they start the Q course, they have to go to SOMSI. Or, uh, well, it's not called SOMSI for them. It's SOMSI for, like, the Rangers, the SEALs back then, and, and like, anybody that was doing the short course. Because the short course was, oh, like. Oh, you have two versions of it. Yeah, Spec Ops okay. Medics. And you all go through. I think it was like six months. And then at the end of six months, all your SF dudes continue on with the program. Okay. And then your ranger medics, your your SEAL medics, because we had SEAL medics coming through. Um, yeah, now I'm it, forgetting what the SF guys call the yeah. their medic portion. SOP, I'm, th I'm getting confused. SOPSI is the pre-SF guys. That's right. what it is. They go to SOPSI, then selection. Right. And then the medics go to... Um, Anyway, that six month course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, your your Delta medics they go to the full. I think it's like nine months. You know, total. They do like an additional three months after they kick out all the freaking Ranger medics and stuff like that. Because, uh, again, this is like from the '90s. This isn't like current. You know, training culture now. All of your PJs go through like a four in, you know, uh, a basic paramedic course you know, at Kirtland Air Force Base, and it's just straight paramedic. There's no trauma medicine. There's no live tissue like you had at SOMSI, which I thought was highly beneficial. And when I went through SOMSI, not only did we have to learn the paramedic medicine, because you had to pass your paramedic exam at the end, but you had to learn, like, military medicine. And it's two different things, two different worlds, you know. Mm. There's no O2 in transport right. in, in, in military medicine. Like it's like, world. this motherfucker's bleeding, like, take care of it. Yeah, fix it. Yeah. So instead of ABC, airway breathing circulation, it's CAB, circulation airway breathing. So you had to be able to deconflict the two different kinds of medicine as you're going through. And, and um, I know that the trauma portion of SOMSI was so intense that like we were losing guys, like guys were getting failed out of the course, like left and right. And um, it was, it was um, I think I was at the height of my medical skills coming out of there. Like not just, not just trauma, but also like straight medicine, like being able to diagnose an ectopic pregnancy based on patient history. You know what I mean? Because it was so intense and the idea that you could be the only medical 
asset on the ground wherever you go. And that's what they were really preaching because those 18 Delta guys, that's what they move on to be. They're damn near PAs. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're, they're the guys that like burn a genital warts off of somebody in a, in a mosquito filled closet in the middle of like, I don't know, the Serengeti. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they got to be highly capable, highly competent. And if you're not that, you can freaking get washed out. And then again, there's behavior problems as you go through the pipeline, you know, where guys will get washed out, especially you talk about young dudes and you send them on this pipeline where they're pretty much unsupervised, you know, young 18, 19, 20 year old guys, and you're bouncing from course to course to course, you know, and and you're interacting with older guys who are able to, you know, compensate. And luckily I'd already been a ranger. So I had a certain amount of military maturity to be able to balance like you know how much studying and partying you know you could Mm -hmm. actually do and then a lot of guys can't do that you know you're 20 years old you're unleashed on the world and like you can you have access to booze and 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 partying and you know how it is there are guys that are just sloppy messes like Mm -hmm. they can't they can't get it together and then, of course, the last hundred days of PJ school, you'll have guys wash out, you know, like not fit. Like they, they can't put together all these skills that they learned in the pipeline into the job. Like airborne school, that's infill. You know, it's infill. Okay, that's one part of the mission. Free fall school, well, that's one part of the mission. Again, another attrition rate course, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, we had a guy in free fall that just wouldn't pull his chute. And so every time he wasn't a Green Beret, I, right. I don't remember where he came from, but they were like, "Dude, if you don't pull your chute at the right altitude, mm-hmm. you're done." Like I don't understand why you're you're just staring at me. Yeah. And his co- instructor kept telling me, "Like st- you're you're just staring at me, and you're blanking out. Pull your damn chute." And he went up again and just stared at him and just stayed in free fall. And so his instructor had to pull a chute for him again. And he was like, "You're done." Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So you, you've got these. You, you don't know if you're going to be able to accomplish all of the tasks that go into it. But again, every time that you overcome difficulty, like I had some trouble with stability, like arching. No, I didn't, too. like when they were like, arch your back, I was arching like I was in a porn movie. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I, mean? I didn't understand that like, hey, working. make it's a like... V with your body, point your dick at the dirt. Like right. that's how it really is. And, and, and uh, so I had some problems with stability. And uh, there were a couple of jumps where, you know, I had bad exits or whatever, and they're like, "Okay, dude, like this is it. You're on the you're on the line. You better be able to do this." And you know, and then you sort it out or you don't. And if you don't sort it out, guess what? You get dropped from the course. You might have a chance to go back and repeat it, but if you're a non-performer, if you can't rise to the occasion, even when you're like faltering a little bit, if you can't correct your mistakes and you can't, you know compensate for those deficiencies and correct them then it's 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 you know you're going to get washed out and rightly so Mm -hmm. especially like repeated things and um and uh i really liked that idea because there were things that i was bad at when i was at the end doc i was on the i was on the red line all the time like i'd be on the red line every other week for like treading you know what I mean? Like I did not know how to tread water. You got all these guys, the freaking water polo dudes, they're doing, doing the egg beater, thing, yeah. no problem. I got like the modified gallop going on, <laughs> like smoker lung, <laughs> Try, trying to keep it together. But like again, you either go to the pool and you work on it, and you and you're determined, and you and you make it, or you don't, or or you do learn to beat eggs. And so then, you know, that's kind of like what I would do. I was like, okay, teach me this egg beater. I'd grab a couple of guys and we go to the pool after after work when we're exhausted tired whatever but like i need help and you got a couple of guys are like okay i'm gonna help you and we're gonna learn how to do this i never swam with fins on my feet before my life before i got to the end document they're like bicycling you know and guys Mm -hmm. are like you are the most effed up swimmer ever and then you know you get in the pool with them after work and you work on your technique or on the weekends you're working on your technique and the next thing you know you're like the first guy out of the pool on the on the final swim because you like sorted it out that's insane, yeah. man. I, I did, um, before I got the Halo spot, I was going to, I got top of the class for the Q course, so that I was going to get a choice. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I'm going to pick dive because that's a harder one to do. Mm-hmm. And I want to challenge myself. And I started training for dive school. And you're, you say it like it's so easy, right? You say mm-hmm. it like, I just learned how to do it. It's so hard to come up with those deficiencies in the water. It's mm-hmm. unbelievably hard to learn how to fight panic 
in that 50 meter subsurface. It's unbelievably hard to get your ankles used to swimming with fins mm -hmm. that are this long and weigh like five pounds yeah, each. It, it's is one of the worst training. And I was just putting myself through it. I haven't even done anything like you did where they're actually, it's do or die. Yeah. And it was the worst experience of my life. So when they came out and they're like, hey, you're, you got a halo spot. I was like, <laughs> thank you, Jesus, dude. Because yeah. it was, it's, that is for a reason, the hardest school in the military. Yeah. And, and one of the things, I, I went to the SWIC, the, the SWIC dive school down in Key West. You know, that's where everybody went that's back it. in the day. That's now the, the Air Force has their own dive school. They created their own because of there was an attrition that they did, weren't happy with. Yeah, I bet. You know what I mean? And they're like, we got to train our guys to do our thing or whatever. And, and again, I don't know all of the politics of it, but I disagreed with it. Just like when we broke away from SOMSI. You know, when they were like, uh, SOMSI after 9-11, they were like, we're not teaching paramedic anymore. And, you know, we're, we're, we're just teaching trauma medics. We're teaching like SF medic. We're teaching like dirt medicine. We're teaching these guys how to be combat medics. And so they eliminated the paramedic certification that we still required. So we had to create our own little school on on the uh, out in Albuquerque but I never liked it because there was a difference you could tell the difference between a medic that went to SOMC and a medic that went to the 4N program because I became an instructor when that transition happened and I remember the first class where we had like two or three SOMC medics and then we had two or three guys from the from the paramedic program and there was just a difference. Mm. And I was like, man, these guys are not combat focused. And that, but that's why PJ medicine is, such, is a part of the program in Albuquerque at the PJ school, P, uh, pararescue and combat rescue operator school. It was just the PJ school when I got there. Yeah. And then they decided to bring in officers for. I mean, know. PJs, PJs are known for being the shit. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's an underrated, I, it's almost as though the the general populace doesn't realize how cool they are. Mm -hmm. It's internal, military internal. Yeah. You're like, oh, PJ, that's dope ass job. Well, it's definitely special operations focused. You know, when you work with PJs and, and you see what the capability is, especially like your STS teams and stuff like that, and you, you get the, that firsthand experience of like how professional these guys can be at the same time as being very relaxed about like the way that they execute um i that's what impressed me as a ranger like you know what i mean like these guys aren't yelling at each other mm -hmm. they don't have like some private they got to wipe his ass everywhere he goes like everybody's a man because you went through this two-year process you know you went through this pipeline and if you couldn't handle yourself and like self-study and and like step up and like be kind of like responsible you know without somebody like running around mm -hmm. cleaning up after you then you're not going to make it through the course like as a as a ranger like fire team leader senior gunner you know you would get these privates that you're like i gotta f i gotta do everything for this guy mm -hmm. i gotta teach him everything and, and we actually called it raised you know being raised in battalion like i'm raising like this guy baby. Yeah, bat baby. Mm -hmm. Like I gotta raise this guy, and you know when you show up to the ranger battalion, you don't have a ranger tab, you know what I mean? Unless you came from another unit, and then those guys were, you know, generally frowned upon. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like he's from out of town. You know, this guy just showed up with his tab, but he doesn't know what it means to be a ranger. You went through ranger school, but that's not being a ranger. Right. And um, and anybody that says that they were they were a ranger, but it wasn't in the ranger battalion, is full of shit. Right. Like you're ranger qualified. Right. You're qualified to be a team leader in a ranger battalion. That doesn't make you a fucking ranger. Right. Ranger battalion is an entirely different animal. Yeah, I had to do a video on that because I got so many questions. I was like, listen, the scroll mm -hmm. is a ranger. Yeah. The tab is not a ranger. It's the, a qualification the, badge. The tab is a school. Yeah. You went to a school, you passed, you get your badge for going. Mm -hmm. The scroll is what a ranger. The scroll is special operations. The yeah. tab is a school that you can graduate in. in I, I actually called the guy out at uh, at uh, in the at PJ school, and I won't say his name, but <laughs> but he was like, "Yeah, I was a ranger," and I was like, "What battalion?" He goes, "No, at the 82nd." I was like, "You weren't a mm -hmm. fucking ranger, bro. Mm -hmm. If you weren't at the battalion, if you weren't at the regiment, you were not a fucking ranger. Like that's it. That's all there is to it. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys out there that have ranger tabs. They're gonna have beef with this. Fuck you. 
<laughs> I mean, the facts are the facts. Dude. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing. There's there's no way around it. Ranger school is hard. They're not yeah. taken away from ranger school, yeah. but you're not a ranger. I, I always tell people you don't get the full devastating effect of ranger school unless you recycle a phase. <laughs> so I recycled Florida phase, the very last phase. Oh, so you get ranger school too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you had the stack. Yeah. So I was I went to RASP. Yeah. And I got hurt in RASP. Yeah. And then went healed up and then went to SFAS. And uh, man, just walking around there, seeing the the people with the scrolls and the tabs, yeah. and that tan berets. It was tan when I was going through. It was 2010, and I was like, Dude, "Those guys were on this this pedestal." But you you it, the two together, yeah. And people don't know it's like yeah. the scroll makes your ranger, your yeah. special operations, the, yeah. the tab. But when you put them together, yeah, you, that's that's well, the gangster it, shit. You couldn't be, I mean, you could be like an interim fire team leader or something like that. You could step into a position and be capable and competent. But like to be, really be technically a, a, a fire team leader or higher in the Ranger Battalion when I was there, you had to have your Ranger tab. Mm. Like it's time. And I went to Ranger School after nine months in the battalion. I had to freaking dislocate a guy's knee to do it because that's what it was. It was like we got this slot one slot for our platoon these two guys are even so we're gonna you know two men enter and one man leaves and the guy are you serious you guys did that yeah man for real and his name was uh, eric Carell, and i still feel bad to this day like they've circled up around me and eric and they're like okay you guys it's a wrestle off and i dropped my shoulder on his knee like messed up his knee He's screaming on the ground. I get up and I'm like, I'm going to Ranger School. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you, know? you broke and a dude's knee it, to get us spot yeah, to man. Ranger and School. And like when I got back from Ranger School, this guy's still in the knee brace, and like that's where the guilt kind of kicked in. Like I, this is what I had, I did to this guy, and possibly like to the detriment of his career to further my own, yeah, you know, my own selfish interest, my own prog- career progression. And I don't think stuff like that happens as much anymore, but I also appreciated that like it's warrior culture, man. Yeah, cutthroat. Yeah, it's cutthroat. It's like, warrior hey, it's you culture. and me. Yeah. And you know, and I, I've told this story before, but it's like uh, being on the range in SF, and I got into an argument with one of the team guys, and so the whole team circled us up, put us in the middle, yeah. and we fought. Yeah. And he, I was spitting out blood, and it, that's the culture sometimes, and that's how you got to do it. And at the end of the day, I helped him up. We hugged it out, and we saw – we reached a new level mm-hmm. that day because I didn't think he was willing to fight. And yeah. so when we started fighting, he pops me in the jaw. I bit my tongue. It was like a huge hole in my tongue. I'm mm-hmm. bleeding everywhere. I was like, you're down. Yeah. And if you could be down to fight me right now, when we're in combat – you're probably going to have my back. Yeah. And, and you know, I, we used to call it take it to the wood line in the Ranger Battalion. Take it to the wood line. Go into the fucking wood line, sort it out, and mm-hmm. then come out. And when it's sorted out, whatever. And, um, I mean, we used to have platoon brawls. We had the the hallway champ. You know what I mean? So, like, that's... Uh, What's the hallway champ? Well, I'll get into it in a second. <laughs> but but uh, I remember when I was a PJ and we were at scuba school and, you know, our team was having a little bit of difficulty. You know, we there was some targeting of the Air Force guys. And, and of course, you know, I already had, like, some stuff under my belt, you know. Damn right you did. So, I mean, a scroll yeah, and a tab. Yeah. And... So, you know, these younger guys were kind of, I want to say not – they were – being bitches dude mm. they were being bitches and i had drugged like my swim partner to shore on like a drager swim and you know he went tits up on shore and and then next thing i know i'm like standing under the fucking flagpole like he's asking for a new swim partner because i tried to kill him and one of the instructors was like what are you going to do if you hit the shore and and y- your team isn't behind you how are you going to complete the mission my smart ass, right? I go, though I be the lone survivor. Ah! Oh, my God. <laughs> the dude. Ranger Creed. The, the wrong thing to say, right? I said, though I be the lone survivor. And I remember there was a guy, Lee Schaefer. He was there, and he was just like, oh, my God. Like this, He's like this fucking guy. And then the Craig Powers, he was a CCT guy, and he's just lost his shit. He's like, you ain't a Ranger anymore. You're a fucking PJ. Like, you don't do this to your fucking homies. And uh, I was like, okay. So I got my ass chewed. But then we were having like a little inner team meeting later. And me and a guy, Donovan Chapman, started to like really like go at it. And Donovan's, you know, great former PJ, country music artist, whatever. And we started going at it in this room with all of us. And, and he's like, we'll take it across the street, right? And then I didn't even let him finish. 
like what he was saying. I was like, we'll take it to the wood line, motherfucker. <laughs> like a jump up and like the whole team's like trying to peel us apart. And, you know, it was just a different attitude, you know, when it when you talk about the difference between being a Ranger and then being a PJ. Like, you know, in the Ranger battalion, I feel like I could have fisticuffs with anybody mm. and then have drinks afterwards and we're good to go. And then versus in the Air Force, you know, I, you bring this kind of Ranger attitude. And it was like, bro, like you are... You know, you question authority all the time. You've got a bad attitude. You know, you chew out your fellow PJs. You're, you know, you're, and then, and then on top of that, like, I, like I'll admit, like my off-duty behavior was reprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> nefarious. <laughs> I don't want to say nefarious, but I mean, let's just say that when I was, you know, the work hard, play hard thing yeah. that I brought from the Ranger Battalion didn't necessarily fit in with the culture of like being a PJ. I mean, certain certain individuals, yes, but I know that like as you go higher up in rank, there's a different expectation of like political correctness, mm -hmm. you know, um, being able to compromise, being able to, and, and compromise is something that I think very low of, the idea of compromise. Compromise in your marriage. Don't compromise your integrity. Don't compromise, you know, your beliefs, your morals, your values. Like, there are some things that are not to be compromised in your world. But uh, the idea of, like, compromising, of appeasing, of, of uh, you know, being um, political, I didn't like it. I never wanted to be that. I always just wanted to be a warrior, you know, and I never really got the opportunity to be what I wanted to be just through circumstances, choices that I made, I, you know, one of my biggest regrets is that I never got deployed and I wanted it so bad. Like I was chomping at the bit for it. I tried to backdoor chains of command to get deployments and, and it always seemed like there was like a roadblock that mm. I just couldn't get past. And it was probably my own attitude and behavior and the way that I engaged in it as well. You know, I, I was you know as someone who's deployed I, I would say first of all there's guys in group that have done whole careers and never seen combat mm -hmm. it's just the luck of the draw right but then also being prior sf and knowing your the schools that you've done and the selection process that you've done there's no question the hardness yeah right and it's like would have would a combat have been anything that you didn't experience through those training environments no I've been shot at. I've shot at people. Uh, does that after Ranger School rip PJ selection, mm -hmm. that thing is literally just the reactionary part of all of that training. Yeah, it's the muscle memory. It's just the muscle yeah. memory. So yeah. I know everyone wants that experience, but having been through that, but and then having the SF training, to me, it, it doesn't change anything for you because yeah. it's like you did all the hard part. Yeah, and then that little tail end is literally just you reacting based on all this training that you've done. Well, that's also a reason that like a lot of people don't know about my military background. You know, I'm not one of those guys that's out there saying I did this, I did that. Mm -hmm. I'm fucking X Y Z, or you know, or that I've got any kind of special insight into you know, especially combat. Like I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I know medicine, I know trauma, I know like what I did in the military. I know that, you know, if I had been given those orders to go down range, I would have been there and like done it, you know, just as, just as, I don't want to say as good as the next guy, but like I, with as much effort mm -hmm. as, the, as the next guy. Um, because but, in the trenches in ranger school yeah. is war. Yeah. In the in the underwater when you want to breathe and you can't is war. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. that you went through war. <laughs> it's just this version of it yeah. you didn't do. And I think that's what people don't understand and they need to understand. And that's why our training is so difficult mm -hmm. and why it makes special operations soldiers. War doesn't make operators. Well, yeah. And and one of the again, I have a big heartache with like the politics of, of the military. You know, the idea that you got to make something achievable for everybody or, you know, everybody deserves a black beret because we're all special. No, you're fucking not. No, you're fucking not. Like, yeah, I appreciate your service. I appreciate that. Right. But like there's there's a certain level of 
of aptitude and attitude that creates a special operations warrior Mm -hmm. you know what i mean whether you're male or female whatever and i've said this before like if my big sister wanted to be a ranger she could have been because uh, you know she'll fuck all you guys with her big dick you know what i mean like she's a badass like uh, you know a tough broad and there are some females out there to, to that could do what we've done but the idea of altering standards changing the training behavior changing the attitudes you know to facilitate a minority again that's compromise that i don't believe in you know compromise in your personal relationship don't compromise when it comes to effective execution of objectives right right we're non-compromising and again, this is a problem that veterans have when they leave the military. We, we live in a world of like no compromise. There is no compromise. There's the objective and you complete the objective no matter what it takes. If you compromise, then you don't freaking win the battle. You don't mm-hmm. win the tick. You don't freaking, you, 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 don't, uh, you don't advance on the objective, right? Because you just compromised. So, you know, now there's this idea of like compromising all the time everything like it's got to be a compromise you know and and i don't believe in that at all you know i i I believe in like in your relationship okay it should be 50 50 sometimes you got to sacrifice you know something that you want for something that everybody you know that, that your partner wants but in in military there should be no compromise it's an uncompromising environment and the second you start to compromise you compromise your integrity compromise your position you compromise uh security you know you've just that's weakness Mm. and you don't do that and again we as military guys we have a problem when we come out of the military like getting jobs now you have to compromise with your boss you have to compromise this you have to compromise that and and it's just something that i've always had a, a problem with yeah, it's funny that you say that because I, I, when I became a cop, so I got out of special operations before. I'm pouring this. Have at it, I'm bro. pouring this. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm gonna drink my neat this time. I'm, 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 I'm glad so, about that. I brought that bottle. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> I brought that bottle too. Uh, so when I and I became a cop in there was compromise in mm-hmm. the police department. Mm-hmm. And I, and you're 100% right, and I never thought about it that way, but I, I would see f- uh, cops not responding to shooting calls mm-hmm. because they chose not to wear vests. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how is this acceptable? Mm-hmm. How do you know that this officer does not have a bulletproof vest on? Mm-hmm. And then also know that when a hot call comes in, this officer is not showing up. Mm-hmm. Even though they're dispatched to the call, because you know that they they wear their unwillingness to go to these calls by the fact that they don't wear a bulletproof vest mm-hmm. to work. Mm-hmm. So they've made the decision. I'm not going to a hot call, so therefore I do not need my vest. Yeah. And so they allowed that to happen. And you're right. It's like the minute you compromise one, now you've compromised the whole chain because mm-hmm. we're all connected and we're all linked. Mm-hmm. And now everyone's looking at us like, well, do I have to go to a hot call? Mm-hmm. If I don't want to, you got these hitters over here. Mm-hmm. You know, I got my my partner is an old Marine. I got, you know, uh, Army guys. They want to go. Let them go. Mm-hmm. So now we've compromised, and now we have a weak link. Well, it's it's even like I mean, you see it today. Like I think LAPD. You know, they just they just put out a thing where they're not going to prosecute certain crimes. You know, and and that is a compromise of sorts. You know, the, the the authority of law is based on the fact that the people who are enforcing the law have more power than the criminals who are breaking it, right? And when you start to compromise that power, now there's a shift in power. Like cartels is a great example, right? In Mexico, cartels enforce cartel laws because they are willing to uncompromisingly enforce their own laws with greater authority and power than the people that are in that, that are trying to enforce, you know, the rule of law. And how does that happen? Well, now you're listening to a minority of people who complain that the laws are too strict, the laws are, you know, take away from government funds or whatever, you know, whatever the argument is, you've got law enforcement agencies that are now compromising 
their integrity. They're compromising the the law and they're taking power away from the people that are there to enforce it. And if you're not willing to enforce with uncompromising authority the laws of wherever you whatever region you live in, then somebody else is going to enforce their laws. And are they going to be fair? Are they going to be just, you know, those laws that are being enforced? I think that, you know, the idea that you cannot, you know, prosecute a nonviolent crime in, in L.A. County now is total BS. You know, from arm, from robbery to, to car theft to like whatever. OK, so now we've given up all that authority mm. by compromising. And f- to what end? To what end? I mean, so that crime can continue to build and like now your community is like, you know, you got to I got to I got to enforce I got to enforce the law myself now. I have to enforce like what is my God given right to protect. And then by doing that, you put yourself in a position where you are now subject to prosecution for protecting yourself from guys that should have been prosecuted to begin with. Mm. So anyway. Yeah. That was yeah. a good topic. Yeah. So you went P- – how long were you PJ? I was a PJ – well, I went into the pipeline in 98. I graduated in 2000, and then I left active duty in 2007, and I did one-year wow. reserves so you, you like did. 2008. Between your Ranger time and your PJ time, you did a good amount of time. Like operation. roughly 15 years. You know, wow. there were a couple breaks in service there, you know, between active duty and like coming back in. But roughly 15 years. And, and again, I never wanted to be – and the higher you get in rank, the more they try to push you behind a desk. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I never wanted that. I was always a capable operator, physically capable. I felt like I was competent. You know, I, I, I was a seven level PJ. I was a jump master. I, you know, I, I, I had the ability to continue to execute as a, as a team leader. And then, and then I wanted to make changes to the system, especially when I was like a reserve PJ down in Florida. I wanted to make changes to the system. I wanted to, you know, make guys more accountable for their own training, their own upgrade, their own like, you know, are are you fucking green across the board for, you know, being on, on deployment status? You know, like there were things that I just wanted to do and expectations that I had that, you know, a lot of times I would run into well, this guy showed up late, you know, for, for a team meeting. And I was like, I was getting a blow job. You know, that's the only reason that you're allowed to be late for anything, <laughs> you know? So, so you, wait, were you saying that you showed yeah, up late? Yeah, to? I showed okay. up late to a team. <laughs> so I'm trying to like, like trying to implement like some, some accountability changes and some training changes and, and the idea that like of making the team more effective on, on the military, you know, on the, on the operational side, but then on the admin side, they're like, why are we listening to this guy who showed up late to a team meeting? I'm like, because it was a blowjob yeah. all right it's like, like what would you have done yeah exactly <laughs> so and i'm not saying that that's cool or anything <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying in hindsight you know i i, I didn't i really... mean it is what it is yeah, yeah. and if you've ever had a blowjob before <laughs> yeah they feel pretty damn it's good few and far between sometimes <laughs> you gotta take it when you can get it like i'm gonna be fucking five minutes late it's okay yeah. it's like, <laughs> i'll just I tell accept. everybody I i'll just tell everybody i was getting a blowjob they'll yeah. understand they'll know it's cool <laughs> no but um Oh shit, man! That was too real. <laughs> oh, I love it, dude. I, I've been married twelve years. I know, like, when those times don't, come. Don't man. say it. Don't say it. Check yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we could we could be in the middle of church if that offer comes from the wife. I'm taking. We're leaving. It. We're, We're leaving. leaving. <laughs> God forgive me. <laughs> Running out. <laughs> God forgive me. That's you understand. You get it. <laughs> like in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I love you. I'm out. <laughs> I got you. I got you. But um, you know, I. I I think that I had a hard time in the military because I a little bit a lot of ego a lot of ego like the more you get qualified the more you get capable Mm -hmm. the more you're competent in your job and the operation and and you're the guy that everybody is like okay fucking we're gonna throw this to will we're gonna fucking throw it to whatever and you're able to follow through on the mission and accomplish the mission and your after action reviews are pretty minimal you know what i mean the more the more that you get confident in that it it can come off as like cockiness as well and then that can turn into a little bit of ego 
and then you know your ego can get in the way of progression because you're you become this uncompromising individual Hmm. you know like i know what i'm talking about like f off i hate you i hate you i hate you you suck suck my balls you know whatever and um you know that wasn't a good fit for me and on top of that i've been described as like a flamboyant individual which means I'm like the kind of guy that shows up with a smile on my face when shit's going wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean, I'm like the kind of guy that revels in conflict. And mm. I'm also the kind of guy that like when we're off work, like I'm organizing the the team deployment to Vegas so that we can all like get hammered and engage in debauchery. Mm. You know, that used to be, well, it's still Real no-no bit. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a real despicable kind of thing that operators just hate. Yeah, yeah. And well, just stay was, away from. I was the I was Green the I was the kind partake. of guy that the, the the wives hated. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I know. I'll speak on behalf of Green Berets. We would have avoided you at all costs. Yeah, man. I'm I'm, I'm like the guy that's like on, if, if if you're out of town on a TDY, you like come to my room. I I got a plan. But like if you're at home, stay the fuck away. <laughs> like your wife hates me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I'm going to get you into trouble. Right. But, um, yeah, man, I enjoyed the operational side of everything I did in the military. I enjoyed everything that, uh, you know, as, like the running, the jumping, the shooting, you know, all of this stuff. And I really cared about, like, being great at those things. But, like, the interpersonal relationships, I didn't give a shit about. Mm. Like, I have maybe two PJ friends. Like, okay, I'm going to say, like, eight eight real PJ friends that I can call like every week and it's just like no time has passed and and you know my ranger buddies are actually a, I'm a lot closer to some of them than I am the PJ side and that's like even further back in history because you know we were the same breed the same mm-hmm. attitude the same sort of thing and then when I went into the TV industry I lost a lot of that whoa don't skip no, I'm we're skipping. going from 15 years right. of a pretty badass military career, right? And then you decide to get out. Mm-hmm. How does TV even come into your mind? Though? Well, uh, I was in command-directed anger management in the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> I was in command-directed anger management, and um, when I was in command-directed anger management, it was like this six-week program, and I had to go like twice a week or whatever, and. And, I can um, just see you at the front. You're like, hi, everyone. Like, I'm not uh, fucking angry. What are you I angry will? about? <laughs> my name is Will. Hi, Will. <laughs> my name's Will, and I'm pissed <laughs> off that I got to fucking be here. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I got I, I got sent to command direct and anger management because, you know, I had a I had a habit of popping off at the mouth, you know, telling people what I really thought. Nobody. And, and here's the setup. Here's what I fucking hate. What do you think, Willis? That's a freaking baited trap, you know what I mean? And I always went for the bait. You know, I was never the guy that held back, like, what I really thought. And other guys were like, dude, I love you for saying all that, but didn't you see it coming? Yeah. Like, didn't you see the trap coming? And I would always, always, always be the guy that was just like, I'm going to tell you exactly what I fucking think. You're diving on the sword. And you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it. And it's going to be in my own words. And um, but anyway, I was in command directed anger management and I had already kind of been on the set of Beer Fest, you know what I mean? Just kind of like through an accidental sort of set of circumstances. And um, and then it was recommended to me that I explore some ways to like vent my uh, my aggression, my anger, my emotions, because, you know, you we're pretty closed off people you know what I mean like when I'm dealing with something I deal with it alone in a garage with a torch and a hammer and some metal you know what I mean I'm like beating the shit out of something or I'm out doing PT or I freaking do squats until I cry you know that kind of thing you know you internalize everything and they were like well you need to learn a way to express this and and I was a writer so you know it started with writing and then some acting classes were suggested and then I ended up like taking some acting classes just to learn how to vent mm-hmm. my shit. And uh, and then when I was getting out of active duty, uh, somebody sent me a sarcastic email. Ray Colon Lopez. He's like the he's like the chief enlisted advisor at the White House, right now. But like back then, he was just Ray. I got the dirt on you, Ray. <laughs> but anyway, so Ray uh, Colon Lopez he sent me an email from a producer. Uh, looking for a PJ to host a show called True Stories of Pararescue. 
And he in the email said, "This looks like it's right up your alley, Hollywood," because the fellas had they'd learned about beer fest. You know what I mean? They they they'd learned that I was going to acting classes, and you know, in, entertainment industry and movies was I was always a cinephile. You know, I was the guy. If you needed a movie quote, I give it to you. I used to entertain everybody at. Like, there's still stories of me at Somsi or at the Ranger Battalion, like, riding around on Steve Kowatch's back giving the fucking Braveheart speech. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, Sons of Scotland. Like, <laughs> I was that guy. I was that guy that was there to, like, have a good time. And, yeah. and to me, a lot of that was, like, you know, we love movies in the military. So I was the guy. I was a cinephile. And then, yo, know, Ray sent me the email. This is looks like it's right up your alley, Hollywood. And that's word for word. And I was like, you know what? You want to play this game? I'm going to play this game. So I called the producer, you know, who put out this ad. And then next thing I know, I'm flying out to Burbank. I'm doing a screen test. You know, I had an interesting background, former Army Ranger. Great. And former PJ. Oh, mm-hmm. that's even better. You know, how many guys do that? And then I had been teaching for so long that I was so used to presenting information that it was very natural for me to engage in in that sort of thing like just presenting information regardless of what it was and then that show turned into a sizzle reel for for uh, deadliest warrior which i didn't host but i shot the sizzle for it and then then and then based on my background they created like spec ops mission which was that one was cool on that military. was one where you went and like tried to do the mi- yeah did the mission, tried to right? do the missions yeah, right yeah yeah that was a cool show dude the, the funny thing about that one is is that like the very first one we did the very first one we did um i kind of went rogue you know, I wasn't communicating with producers very well. I wouldn't tell them where I was. I left all my... I'm filming myself, right? And, and no credits. No credits, by the way. No cameraman <laughs> credit. No producer credit. Yeah, man. I'm, like, filming myself. And then, you know, these guys are asking, like, producers, they're making a TV show. They're like, we need to tape. We need to see the video. We need to see all the... All the... Uh, all of the... Uh, all of the... You know, whatever you've been doing. And I'm like leaving it at a cache site with an eight digit grid coordinate. <laughs> I mean, like you can find that shit here because I was playing it up real. Yeah. And then and then after the first episode, they really and, and meanwhile, between episodes, I'm like driving a cab in Florida, you know, like like I'm flying back and forth from Florida, driving a taxi cab and filming a TV show. Sounds like nonsense. Right. And then um, so anyway, they started like really limiting how much information they gave me and and like narrowing the boundaries of like what I could do. Like, OK, you got to go here first. And then so they, oh, okay. they started orchestrating the show and making it not just not just difficult to execute the missions, but. You know, everybody wants to see guys shoot each other with sims. Right. So it was almost like they're walking me into an ambush every every chance they got. So it was it was Which difficult. Which gotta to be navigate. frustrating because the world is watching you, mm-hmm. ranger experience, your mm-hmm. pararescue rescue experience, what you non combat experience, by the way. Yeah. But all that training, they want to know what you would do. Yeah. And so now you're taking my left and right limits. And you're you're narrowing the yeah. focus, and you're canceling all the things. That yeah, I would do all the options that I have that I like, would take in real life. Yeah, and and it was it was a fun show, but I can actually remember like threatening a producer or a director at one point. Like if you make like I already feel like an asshole. I already feel like an asshole because I'm out here doing some Rambo shit. Yeah, you know what I mean. But but like if you make me look like a fucking asshole, like more than I already feel. I was like, I'm going to show up at your house one day and you're going to be wondering why I'm holding on to your cat standing at the end of your bed. <laughs> like, what are you going to do with that cat, buddy? It's 4 a.m. What, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, I'm just here to talk. <laughs> you know, so... So <laughs> if you ever want to see mittens again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but like I learned I learned a lot and then the same production company hired me to do a show about guns, which was great, you know, based on and I've probably shot more different varieties of guns from all over the world, you know, um with that show Triggers. It was also on the military channel and Discovery was great. They were amazing to me. They treated me really well. I always had a handler everywhere I went. 
Yeah, so, 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 it's like he controls him. Yeah. Like he's really good. But a handler who's like, you drank 17 beers last <laughs> night. And I'm like, who's counting? She's like, me. I get your bill. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I met a lot of really cool people. But, you know, one thing segued into another. Hmm. And then eventually it was like forged in fire. And, and that, was a, that was a really cool experience because, you know, when I went to the the audition for Forged in Fire, like I was in college, I was in film school, and and um, one of the guys, one of the judges, was a guy that I met when I did my sizzle reels for Deadliest Warrior. Mm. And I'm like, oh, I remember he provided the swords for this episode or the sizzle reel that we did. So there's like a little bit of an instant rapport. And I knew a little bit about forging from like Dungeons and Dragons, right? Because I'm a super fucking nerd. And um, and uh, it just kicked off. It went. It it was it was a good deal from the beginning, and we got to like really create what Jason Knight used to call modern renaissance. You know the idea that like, you know, you can be successful by just like working with your hands. Mm -hmm. You know, doing what mankind was meant to do. We're builders. We're creators. We're we're people with imagination. Like you can take this lump of steel, and you can put it in the fire, and you can make something freaking beautiful and awesome out of it. And you know, like that can be your thing. And you, like you can put your soul into something and make a living out of it. Versus like being you know some data manager. You know what I mean? Where you're not creating anything. You're just managing freaking information. Right. And it's information that's perishable. It's 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 going to go away but like when you make something like an iconic blade or a chef's knife or a katana or something like that and it's well done that's something that's going to be a legacy for you so a jason knight was really cool about like calling it a modern renaissance we reignited this idea of like being a knife maker being a sword maker, not buying something that was like made in China off the shelf, but like really buying something that had heart and soul put into it or, or you know, and I, I didn't want to do anything in the industry that didn't inspire people. I didn't want to do fucking Love Island. Right. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be the host of Are You Tougher Than a Boy Scout? I didn't want to be the host of, of a show that you know, denigrated the human character in any way. I wanted to be the host of a show where, okay, there's going to be a loser, but you got to acknowledge the effort. You got to acknowledge the, the craftsmanship. You got to acknowledge like, you know, what the guys put into it. And that's what I loved about Forged and Fire. I loved the Smiths. I loved the work that they put in. I loved, I loved the effort that it took. I loved, um, I loved like being the guy that could encourage. I loved the you know being the guy that could keep somebody from walking away from the competition and like it, getting them back there on the forge floor. Like get your ass back out there. Like there's no quitting. You got to go back out there and you got to make this happen. What I didn't love was again the backside of it. You know some of the backside of the stuff. I I didn't like that. I didn't like the way some of the decisions were being made. I didn't like the way you know a guy who was a prop maker was all of a sudden a sword maker expert five years later. Like, dude, you make props in fucking Hollywood. And now you're telling me, well, you know in combat. I'm like, you don't know. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, the grip of a weapon is so important. I'm like, have you ever held an M4 carbine? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like the most generic grip ever on the face of the planet. It really is. You know, have you ever held an M9 bayonet? The handle's fucking round, pal. The handle's round, but somehow it's worked mm -hmm. for years and years and years and years and years. Like so, like I felt like there was a little bit of like getting outside of lanes in certain aspects, and 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 you know, qualifications mean something to military guys. It does. And if you're not qualified, you're not certified. You can't show me your certificate of fucking achievement from whatever blade, you know, sword making academy that you went to. Then you're just bunk. You're bullshit. You know, show me, show me what, how did you become an expert sword maker? How did you become an expert on this? Show me your fucking certificate. Show me the fencing school certificate that you went to that qualified you to be able to test this weapon and then comment in such a way as if you're an expert. And that's where I like started to have like really, really big conflicts. You know what I mean? At first it was like everybody was in their lane. 
Everybody was in their lane. But the more it progressed, the more it went on, the more that these guys fed information to each other, the more they became experts in each other's specialities, mm -hmm. including me. I'm not going to lie. Like, I've had more classroom instruction on making a knife than anybody else in the history of fucking knife making. Right. But, but um, you know, it was my job to question their authority, to question their decisions. And my God-given gift above and beyond all things is the ability to piss people off. Yeah. And that's and like and just by asking questions. It's a trend. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time that that gift made you the best host. That that show is not the same without you. As a fan of that show, I'm I'll say it like and this is my perspective and it's not because you're sitting here and I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass. I'm a fan of that show. My daughter's a fan of that show. We love that show. When you left that show, it tanked. I don't know how the ratings do. I don't know. I don't care. Right. For us as fans, that questioning spirit was gone. That why are you doing this? What is he doing? It was like you're you have these three people, and your job you knew your job mm -hmm. is to pull what is happening mm -hmm. with these knives out of these three people. Yeah. And so as the audience, we get to learn why he's doing that that way why he's doing this with the knife, mm -hmm. why it needs to be less red, why is it too hot to go into when he's uh, putting it in the oil, the you know, quench, yeah. the quench, like we're learning. Yeah. And, and, you know, the first couple of seasons I was learning with the audience. So, you know, it was very natural for me to ask the questions you know, that I wanted to know. And then that became a conduit for the audience because mm -hmm. I'm asking the questions that they want to exactly. you know? And then, And then it becomes redundant where you're like discussing some of the same things and you know things. But then it, it, it actually transitioned to a point where, like I'm gonna remember your rationality for mm -hmm. like one blade over another from, from show to show, season to season, whatever. And you got these standards set. And when you start to make a decision that violates the standard that we've come up with or, or, that, or that is contradictory to some rationale that you had like two episodes ago, I'm going to call you on it and be like, well, you know, this is what happened, you know, two episodes ago. And you said this and you're now contradicting that. Like, it, are we getting into like a personal preference or are we getting into standards? And that's something I've always been big on is standards in the military. Uh, I can remember PJ school. We had this guy coming through the PJ school, his team leader, a lieutenant, a couple guys who were like prior service guys. They came to me and they're like, we don't want this guy on our team. And I was like, I agree with you. I think that guy's a piece of shit. I don't think that he should be a fucking PJ. I think, I think that he's substandard across the board. However, whenever he goes through an evaluation, he passes the evaluation. I cannot just arbitrarily as as a staff sergeant or tech sergeant like eliminate a guy from training if he's performing to standards mm. on the days that he's being evaluated he can be a piece of shit 24 fucking 7 and then on his evaluation date rise to the occasion and pass the standard i as an nco cannot make that recommendation, but I got a lieutenant here, I got another tech sergeant here, I got a staff sergeant who was a PJ before, like 10 years ago, and now he's going through training again, and you're telling me that you guys don't like this guy and you don't think he should be a PJ? You've got more power than me. But I have to adhere to the standard, because I'm an instructor. If he's passing the standard, that is what it is. Now, take that over to the TV world. I don't care about the individual dudes. I mean, I do. And like some guys I've stayed in contact with who were contestants, and I love them. I follow their work, and like we're great friends and, and stuff like that. But at the same time, you know, when you're evaluating the work, my personal preference or personal attitudes towards any one guy never came into play. What's the standard? What are we comparing? You know, this we've got a strength test, a sharpness test, a kill test, and we've got performance standards. Like, who came out on top throughout the performance standards? And then we get into aesthetics. Well, a lot of that shit started to alter. It started to change. And that's where, again, my uncompromising attitude was like, we're compromising our integrity to fulfill some, like, 
producers wish on the backside or to make somebody else look like, you know, like somebody's got a great story and we want them to win. Like, well, that's fucking great. Like, they've got a great story. I love their story, too. But at the, at the end of the day, standards matter. And if you don't meet the standard or if you get defeated, like no kidding, like uh, any given Sunday, then you take the defeat. But altering a, a set of standards to create a storyline was something I had a big problem with. Even like Spec Ops Mission, right? I'm going to go backwards. Mm -hmm. So there was an episode of Spec Ops Mission. It was like me and Big Bear and there was winter and snowshoes and snow and all this stuff. There was a moment where... I got outflanked by an SF dude in snowshoes. I'm like running down a creek, which is a linear danger area. And I'm just trying to freaking beat feet down this creek, like making like mad time. And this guy flanked me. Parallel in it or yeah. in the water? Well, I'm in the water, oh, like shit. running down a fucking creek. And this guy freaking outflanks me in snowshoes and he engages me. And he like lights me up all along the body armor, right? And uh, the producers came to me and they were like, we, we got to change it. We got to change that. Like, you can't die. And I said, like, what do you mean? They're like, well, it's your show. You can't die. I was like, bullshit. I was like, this guy was squared the fuck away. This guy outflanked me in snowshoes, came over. I was doing the wrong thing, running down this freaking creek. This guy outflanked me, set up, and engaged me. And, like, it was legit. And I refused to shoot like do any kind of reshoot reenactment that deviated from what really happened mm. and it played well the audience appreciated it they're like holy shit like will didn't complete the mission like there were like two or three objectives in there that i completed but at the end of the day this guy freaking waxed me nice yeah. and 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 that's the kind of guy i am like if it, it is what it is and and you know I think as you get into something like a Forged in Fire show, there's this there's this need to create a narrative that isn't necessarily true. Like when you have judges competing and a judge kicks, you know, gets his ass kicked by somebody, like, oh my God, but he's our judge. Like, what is the public going to think? Maybe, maybe it's going to compromise the integrity of the entire show. I'm like, no, you're compromising your integrity of this episode of the show by changing the results. You know what I mean? You cannot do that. If he got his ass kicked, like let it ride. Good on that guy. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you're stealing 10 grand from somebody and giving it to whatever else you're going to give it to. So that's where I had a lot of issues. That's where I had a lot of problems on top of just being an asshole in general. So. <laughs> well, the 10 grand, I mean, that's a, that's a, it's one thing of pride, but that's an epic moral issue when you have people that that ten grand could change their lives. Yeah, and and like you know when when you're when you're making you know let's say a judge is making ten grand an episode, it's nothing to him. You know, it's nothing to him. But then you got a guy that's like, I need new teeth. Right. And, and that shit really happened. Like a guy's like, I need new. Teeth. Like he won the show, and he's like, I'm gonna get some new teeth. And you and you like that that meant to wor the world to that guy. Yeah. You know, and now you're compromising your integrity so that what you can maintain some sort of illusion, like like somebody's unbeatable. That's not fucking true, on any day. You know, even Mike Tyson got his ass whipped at some fucking point, and and you know, it. it I just I just didn't like that aspect of reality TV because so, it's not real at that point right and it's not inspirational it's not it's not what I wanted it to be like the idea was to inspire people and when you're defrauding people or you're committing what I consider to be fraud um, and again this is just my opinion not everybody agreed with me but when you're defrauding people like I had a big problem with that I didn't want to be the face of fraud I can remember the director of the show coming to me and be like please will just like settle down like fucking bring it down it's okay it's just a tv show i'm like but it's my face out there it's my background it's like you're you're leveraging my qualifications as some sort of subject matter expert into what you're doing and and i will say that i'm a weapons expert you know what i mean i can pick up pretty much any weapon system put it into operation and like make some shit happen mm -hmm. you know so when you're leveraging my lifetime of work to 
you know, have a successful TV show or have a host with credibility. And I'm telling you that like what you're doing is is fraudulent and I don't agree with it. To have that like just arbitrarily dismissed and saying, oh, he's difficult to work with. You know, that was tough for me. And I can remember telling a guy like, I, I don't want to be a part of this if this is how it's going to be. And the next thing you know, I don't have a job anymore. Well, you were, we were talking about that before it started. You didn't just not have a job. They, it seemed like they kind of found a way to not have, to yeah. get rid of you. Well, I was, mean, like, look, you got a contract. And when you're presenting like a paragraph of your contract that covers like fraud and, 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 and uh, gameplay, and you're talking about it in a competent manner, you know, and you've got a lawyer and you've got an agent and you've got like people that are backing you or should be backing you. It's like we, you know, does, is this guy coming from a place of like real legal uh, uh, power base, mm -hmm. you know? And so the way that it went down, I can remember it was like February 2nd of 2020 and my wife had been going through, through some things and I was really stressed out and I was having like a beef with the way the beat the judges competition was going, like major beef, major beef. Like it was, I was so unhappy that at one point I refused to announce one of the judges as the winner. I was like, I will not do that because you guys know for a fucking fact that he got his ass kicked. Like if you want to announce it, go ahead, throw it to one of the judges over there. I was like, but I'm not going to say it. Because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be the voice of like fraud. Imagine being that guy. Yeah. Imagine being the guy that won, and yeah. like this whole time you don't get that credibility. Yeah, exactly. Like you, within the knife community, and yeah. like he he would have that status. I beat a, a judge. Yeah, and you yeah. stole that from him. Yeah, I. That's exactly how I felt. That's exactly how I felt. I felt like it was so unfair that I couldn't say the words. And then next thing you know, like somebody's in my trailer. I drew a, I had a doodle of a guy getting like stabbed through the chest with a knife. And there was another picture of a guy getting his head stomped on by a Chuck Taylor. And everybody knew I wore Chuck Taylors, right? And they're like, and then I get called to a coffee shop where two producers are like saying, we found some, we, we found some drawings in your dressing room. And somehow, somehow they got circulated around set. And there are people on set that don't feel safe with you there. And um, so you're not allowed back to set. We're flying you home today. And uh, we'll let you know what happens. And, and you know, I, you know, you know that scene from Jerry Maguire where, you know, Bob Sugar, like basically fires him at a coffee shop. That's mm. what it was like. I, I, I tell people I got Jerry Maguire at a coffee shop. And, uh, you know, these two guys, you know, I'm sitting there and we had a whole conversation and, you know, we didn't get into the reasonable expectation of privacy, First Amendment, like I can do to whatever the fuck I want, you know what I mean? In in my trailer, I like that doesn't make any sense and and I never threatened anybody. Well, I did threaten the punch Ben Abbott in the face one time because he was texting in the middle of <laughs> like shooting. I told him I was gonna punch him right off the back of his chair if I saw him playing with his nuts again. <laughs> but but uh but you know i mean like you know so anyway you know th there's this whole idea that i drew this picture that people found threatening and but if you go into and i'm an artist i'm a creative guy and there were words written on in like very comic booky text you know they were like kill everybody leave no survivors or leave no witnesses you know like whatever i was just like Drawing. I was just drawing, and and you know, I went to film school. I'm a fucking screenwriter, and and um, and it, th there was nothing like the the way that they made the connection. It was just like they were looking for something to kind of fire me for, and then so I went home, and you know, my wife gave birth on like the the sixth of March. And then on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, they called me and they were like, you know, we're, we're not renewing your contract with this COVID thing, you know, COVID cutbacks, everybody's making budget cuts. And I wasn't surprised. I really wasn't surprised because I was getting to the point where I wouldn't compromise. I was not going to compromise my integrity and my background to facilitate what I thought was fraud. 
And that's the God's honest truth. That's that's the God's honest truth. And I did have a problem with guys like stepping into, you know, expertise that they didn't have. And and I'm a dick, you know what I mean? Like it and here's the thing, I expect the same in return. If I'm speaking out of out of if I'm speaking about something that I really don't have a background in and I'm 100% wrong and somebody who is like a subject matter expert comes in and says like, dude, you need to shut your mouth because you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I respect that. I respect that. And like, I'm, I'm a pretty self-deprecating guy. You know, I'm like, I'm not a smart guy. I'm a tenacious guy, you know, but I'm not like, I'm not like some kind of genius. I don't, I don't, I don't pretend to be something that I'm not, you know, and like I've always been honest about, you know, my military background. I've never said like I deployed and I did this and I did that and like here, here's who I am or anything like that. These are just like factual qualifications that I have. Mm-hmm. But you don't see me on social media like fucking running down the road telling people to stop being a bitch and you know stuff like that <laughs> and, you know I, and, I, and that guy quit the indoc by the way i don't know if you know that <laughs> did you really yeah he fucking was uh so he was a uh, so that guy you know who you are <laughs> yeah. so that guy went to the end goggins we're talking about guy yeah know yeah, yeah we're talking about goggins yeah, okay, so yeah we're talking about goggins yeah. and, I, and again i don't have a beef with him i don't fucking know him and i didn't know that he quit the end doc until my homie brent manny who works at nasa was like yeah i was roommate roommates with that guy he quit at the pool he was at the pool one day and he sucked in the pool and he fucking quit and i'm like holy shit so you got this guy who's like out there and he's like a big motivation guy who and he, and, and he quit the indoc, you know what I mean? And so and indoc for PJs. He was, okay, because he went his, to the indoc to be a PJ, and then he became a SEAL. Because first he was going in for uh, JTAC, right? Is that his thing? No, I don't know. I think he wanted to be a PJ or combat controller. Or I'm sorry, CCT. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, the CCT. Yeah, but CCT, CCT and PJs, we used to all go to the same indoc. Oh, okay. Yeah, That's how that, that changed, you know, over time because. They couldn't get enough controllers through the pipeline. Because <laughs> all the, the swim stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're filling swim stuff. Okay. And like and like again, nothing negative about Goggins. I don't really know about it, that you know that much I don't know that much about them. But like I think a lot of people like the gravitate to the stop being a bitch fucking mentality. And I'm like, no, it's not it's not even about that. Like overcome. Like overcome. It's not like just stop being a bitch. I've had people tell me that. I mean, the last year I've been pretty low, like pretty low. And people are like stop being a fucking bitch. And I'm like fuck you, dude. I'm sad right now. Mm-hmm. I'm not depressed. I'm not suicidal. I'm not. Uh, I'm not manic. I'm not like like I'm just sad. And mm-hmm. it's it's okay to be fucking sad. It's okay to be sad. Like being sad is not the same as being chronically fucking depressed. And sadness can last for a long fucking time. For somebody to look at me and say, stop being a fucking bitch when I'm sad, like fuck the fuck off. Like I'm gonna be sad. I'm gonna be remorseful. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ruminate on fucking all of the events that got me to this point right now. And I talk a lot about men's mental health, right? Like I talk a lot about it on my social media. I used to do Mental Health Mondays. Then I kind of fell off for the last year because I've been going through my own shit, Mm -hmm. you know? And mental toughness isn't about, like, stop being a bitch. It's about, like, understanding, like, okay, what you've been through, what's going on, and how to move forward from there. And it's okay to fucking be sad. It doesn't mean you're depressed, you know what I mean? It it just means that like you have had your heart broken or your soul broken in some sort of way and you're trying to find a way to fucking mend it. For me, I come back to the brotherhood. Come back to the brotherhood. Come back to the things that made you into the person that you are today minus like whatever broke your heart and then rebuild from there. Stop being a bitch is not the fucking answer. Right. Stop being a bitch. What the fuck does that even mean? Right. What does that mean? What does that mean? How do I, imp- like, I, can how do I be, implement that? Like, here's the thing. <laughs> I can be a bitch and still outperform 95% of motherfuckers that are my same age. And it's like still like feel like a bitch at the end of the fucking day. Mm. Because it's not about it's not about it's not about that. It's like it's about my emotional and fucking mental 
uh, well-being. You know what I'm saying? And and it's okay to fucking be sad. It's okay to fucking be, it's even okay to be depressed, but don't mistake sadness for like clinical depression. Don't express, don't, don't, uh, not express, don't mistake being momentarily depressed for like a clinical fucking state. And, and, and then the idea of like, you know, suicide and all this sh shit, I've got suicidal ideation. Every time I step to the end of the ramp, on a fucking parachute jump. I'm like, this might be it, bro. Mm -hmm. Like I am committing some sort of fucking suicide right now by stepping off the end of this ramp with a parachute that somebody else packed that might not freaking open. And I know my emergency procedures and stuff like that, but this might be it. And I've always been comfortable with that. I've always been comfortable with the idea of like death or dying. And, and even like in a lot of ways, put it on a pedestal. You know, this saving private Ryan, you know, sort of like sacrificing myself for the greater good, sort of like death. And, I, and I've and i even visualized like hanging myself, going in my garage, like starting up the Nova and just like letting smog freaking overtake me. Like I've been that sad before. But at the end of the day, you got to worry about the legacy of your soul. Like, what is that going to look like on the back end to my brothers, my sisters, my family? Is this a momentary sort of thing that I'm just feeling right now that I know two days from now, three days from now, like four drinks from now, I might just forget. And I'm not saying alcohol is the answer, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it leaves it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes you just got to find something to smile about for six seconds mm -hmm. that's going to pull you out of that fucking hole. And a lot of people, they get to this point where they're like, okay, there's no relief. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. Like, this is how I, you know, kind of need to take care of this issue. And there was a famous, a famous Navy SEAL that just took his own life. I, I can't remember his name. And, like, you put yourself especially with the number of veterans that commit suicide, you try to put yourself in their place. Like, what are you missing? Well, you went into a world where you felt like everybody's asking you to compromise and you didn't know how to fucking do it. And people are telling you like, that's not okay. You gotta compromise, you gotta compromise. You gotta, you gotta freaking go with the flow. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. Well, fuck that, fuck, fuck your compromise. Like, I've got my shit, and I fucking know who I am. And, like, good, bad, ugly, whatever, like, you got to have the fucking strength of character and this uncompromising sort of attitude in order to be successful in life. People who are successful, they're not compromising individuals. They're uncompromising in a lot of ways. They might be able to politic better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But in a lot of ways, they don't compromise their vision. They don't compromise their goals. They don't freaking compromise, you know, when it comes to just like moving forward. Well, I think that's a good ending point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, dude. You're... It's like a vicious rant, right? Like a vicious alcohol fueled rant. <laughs> like I'm an alcohol burning funny car. It, it, I could keep going for hours, bro. No, I think I I just want to end it there because I don't want to I don't want to veer too far away from all the uh, amazing things you said for veterans and right. helping them be seen and helping them be understood. So, thank you so much, dude. That was an amazing conversation. I'm truly honored to have that conversation with you. Fuck, dude. I, that, I, I, I know there's going to be some blowback, but like, fuck you guys. Thank you so much, dude. What an amazing sit down. Thanks, brother. That was awesome. I yeah. appreciate you having I appreciate me, man. It, it was too, amazing. Dude. All right. Uh, see you guys on the next one.